six uh, right now. Now, uh, following this event, you'll be able to find a link to the recording on the event page on our website. Um, and while you're at our event page, you're welcome to take a look at some of our future events and sign up for those if you're interested. And with that said, I'll move on to introducing our speaker. Dr. Barnett Coven is the training director, near peer competition lead researcher and counterterrorism lead researcher at START. He's also the founder and CEO of BSK Consulting, a professorial lecturer in political science and international affairs at at George Washington University, an associate member of the graduate faculty and a lecturer in public policy at UMD, and an adjunct faculty member at Joint Special Operations University. And Barnett, you can take it away. Great, thank you. Bear with me for just a moment while I share my screen. Aaron, can you confirm you can see that? Yes, I can. Excellent. And so thank you, you all. Did you check the boxes beforehand? I did. Perfect. Occasionally, I actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, thank you, Aaron, very much for organizing this. And thank you all for dialing in and spending your lunch with me. I'm really excited to be speaking with you today about near peer competition and a slightly different take than what you're probably used to hearing. I think we've heard a lot in the news and perhaps in other events about Russian engagement in its near abroad, most um, notably perhaps in the media, thinking about um, Ukraine, both Crimea and the Donbass. We'll talk about that in just a little bit to give some context. Or perhaps um, allegations of Russian meddling in US elections. But we rarely focus on Russian engagement in Latin America. And I think this is an important oversight, right? Russian interest in the region makes perfect sense. It is an area that might be perceived of as the US's backyard, whether that's appropriate or not is another discussion, but for that reason, it is a value to both um, Russia um, as well as the United States. So it's an interesting domain for engagement, yet given the geographic distance from Russia, there will be different ways in which Russia may choose to engage in places like say Colombia or Venezuela. Just a quick overview of where we're going to go today. I want to start off briefly with definitions. I am, after all, an academic, so let's start by ensuring we're all speaking the same language and approaching this from the same vantage point. After that, I want to talk to you about some research, in very brief, um, related to Russian activities in Ukraine. And the purpose of this is to provide a little bit of comparative context. Then we'll move into talking about Latin America. And in particular, we'll focus on, on why the Russians would be interested in the region. Um, and then we'll focus in a little bit more with the case study of Colombia that'll hopefully elucidate a little bit of what's going on in practice. I'll also talk about potential, potential responses, and this will be taken from a um, sort of US-centric um, position. And we'll open it up to question and answer at the end. So in terms of definitions, I first started working on gray zone conflict and Russian activities in this domain in a formal manner for a project in support of US Special Operations Command. So I have continued to use their working definition. As you can see, there's a lot of text here. Let's break this definition down into its constituent parts and I'll focus on three of the most important considerations that comprise this definition. First off, this notion of gray zone conflict involves single or multiple instruments of national power. And so on the right, you should see an image of the Dineville spectrum, right? These are the different instruments of US national power, diplomacy, information, military, economic, finance, intelligence, and law enforcement. And indeed, using multiple instruments of national power really isn't all that unique from other domains of um, competition. But I think what is unique in this domain is um, the relative balance of these different levers of um, influence. And in particular, the relative paucity of the military instrument of national power in these types of competitions. So General Valery Gerasimov, the um, commanding general of the Russian armed forces, is, has been famously quoted as saying that perhaps the appropriate balance of military to non-military means is somewhere on the order of one to four. 
And this has been often quoted as part of Gerasimov doctrine. And I understand there's huge debates about whether or not Gerasimov actually deserves credit for, uh, for coming up with this or if this is old Soviet ideology. There's also debates as to whether or not any of this is, um, if, if this was Gerasimov's intention to field a new doctrine. But regardless, the relative importance of the military instrument has declined relative to other types of armed competition. Secondly, engagements in the gray zone are designed to be ambiguous in nature, or at minimum to cloud attribution. So this is a point when we're not doing it over, doing this type of lecture over WebEx, where I would normally ask participants in the audience to identify these two individuals in the um, photo on the right. And usually one or two people will indicate that these are Russian troops, and that is in fact the correct answer. And then I would follow up by asking, well, how do you know? And this is one where it often stumps a number of people. In military audiences, they tend to get it um, reasonably quickly. But the answer is, this is a, a bit of a trip question. You'll note that there's no identifying insignia, um, no flags, you, no unit insignia, et cetera, on the uniform equipment of these two troopers. If you happen to be an expert in Russian camouflage patterns, you would know that the, this particular camouflage pattern was fielded by the Russian Federation and fielded only in the 2000s, i.e. late enough that it wouldn't likely be floating around the entirety of Eastern Europe like a lot of Soviet era military equipment. But that's a pretty specialized answer that would involve specialized skill. And so what this does, and these two troopers are guarding a municipal airport in Crimea in Ukraine, and what it does is it provides plausible deniability. If I am, say, a German politician, if I'm Angela Merkel, and I don't want to engage the Russians militarily because I understand my country's gas supply is affected by, is almost entirely derived from Russia, I can use this as my out for not escalating the EU's response beyond some minimal level of sanctions because I don't have a clear causus belli. I don't have clear proof that's incontrovertible that the average German citizens can understand that these are Russian troopers because you do not see a Russian Federation flag on their uniform equipment. Secondly, and relatedly, competition in this domain usually exceeds the threshold of ordinary competition, um, so ordinary peacetime economic competition, for example, but yet intentionally falls below the level of large-scale direct military engagements. And this is where we get the notion of the gray zone, right? It's not white peacetime competition, but it's also not um, black declared shooting war type engagements. And so then my next question, if we were doing this with an, uh, an interactive audience would be, what are we looking at in this picture? What type of vessel are we looking at? And this of course is another trick question. Someone would often read the side of this vessel where it says China Coast Guard or pick up on the fact that this vessel is painted white Coast Guard vessels are typically painted white, whereas naval vessels are painted gray, um, and say it's a Chinese Coast Guard vessel. In actuality, this is a People's Liberation Army Navy vessel, i.e. the Chinese Navy. So this is a warship, and yet it has uh, had its paint job changed. And so what this is enables is this vessel can go out and um, extend Chinese activities to extend their economic exclusion zone, to extend their ownership claim over the South China Sea, and it can do it in a way that minimizes the risk of ex escalation. If this vessel were to force a confrontation with the shipping vessel just off frame, you can see, actually I think it's a fishing vessel in this particular photo, you can see some ropes on the side of the vessel that this, where the picture was taken from, and if it were to force a confrontation with this vessel and say sink it, it might do so by ramming into this vessel, a 30-year-old Vietnamese wooden boat versus a steel-hulled naval vessel. You can guess which one's going to win. Yet a kinetic munition wouldn't have been fired in that event. And there's, again, some plausible deniability here. Was this an act of war on the part of the Chinese? Or was it a Coast Guard vessel trying to do maritime interdiction, maritime search and seizure, and the, the captain of the Vietnamese vessel was beha simply behaving erratically, forced collision, and was unfortunately the loser in that event. I think most of us know what we would believe in that instance, but again, the belief is immaterial. It's what can you prove? What can you clearly document if you're looking for an out? Oops, did I go too far? 
I apologize. Clicking around a little bit. But anyway, that's the definition we're going to work from. The reason why you would engage in this type of activity is even if you are militarily more powerful than your opponent, it allows you to achieve objectives at a cheaper cost vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And I think Ukraine is a perfect example of this. In 2014, when Russia invaded Ukraine, first in Crimea and then in the Donbass, Russia had the largest army on the European continent. Ukraine, on paper, looked pretty, um, pretty large as well, with 80,000 men and women under arms. Although it turns out if you do not feed, pay, or maintain your military forces for decades on end, they don't tend to fare particularly well. And the best unclassified estimates I've seen have suggested that as few as 6,000 Ukrainian soldiers were combat effective at the onset of this conflict. But regardless, could, you, could Russia have declared um, a shooting war and invaded Ukraine? Absolutely. Would they have won if they were just fighting Ukrainians? Most likely, yes. The problem is that would have denied them the ambiguity that you get in gray zone conflict, and it would have most likely resulted in a much more vociferous reaction from the European Union, from the United States, perhaps from NATO, even though Ukraine, of course, is not a member of the treaty organization. Instead, they chose to um, engage in gray zone conflict, wherein we saw, following Gerasimov, a paucity of military engagements. Right? The focus was very much on the informational and other domains. This is not to say that Ukraine, especially in the Donbass, um, did not involve a fair bit of kinetic military engagements, but it constituted only about, I think it was 18% in our study of all Russian activities in the region. The bulk were non-military in nature. Importantly, however, what we showed was that the military and non-military instruments of power that were used together were done so in a carefully planned synergistic manner so that um, information operations, for example, could be used to magnify the impact of any military gains or to increase the level of ambiguity after particularly obvious military incursions by Russian forces. So think major tank duels, things of that sort. Importantly, we also learned that Russia in Ukraine was very concerned about public opinion, um, and especially domestic public opinion. In the United States, we've known since at least the Vietnam War that the American public is highly sensitive to US casualties. As soon as American personnel start getting um, killed or seriously injured overseas, US support for wars dries up. And this has been a phenomenon that political scientists and military planners have observed in Western democracies beyond just the United States. More interestingly though, similar findings from the Second Chechen War document that the Russians behaved very similarly. Support for that conflict was overwhelmingly large in Russia during the onset of hostilities. But once Russian forces took serious casualties, the number of um, supporters amongst the Russian public shifted pretty massively, favoring instead withdrawal even absent any type of negotiated agreement. So that's it. I'm gonna stop talking about Ukraine now um, and focus in on Latin America. But I think this Ukraine bit was helpful, hopefully a helpful comparison, especially for those of you who've been following Russian activities in their near abroad. And I think importantly, we learn that some of these aspects will, con will continue to manifest, right? The Russians are gonna to continue to use non-military instruments of national power and trying to project, project power into Latin America. And indeed, we should expect, expect an even greater emphasis on non-military instruments of national power in um, the Western Hemisphere. John Mearsheimer, one of the most famous living political scientists today, famously pontificated about the stopping power of water, right? It is difficult for Russia, or any power for that matter, to project forces that far abroad. And we saw in the Donbass in Ukraine, evident, uh, anyway, how poorly Russian conventional forces fared um, in military engagements. They do have a capable special operations enterprise, but it is limited in its size. So we should, see to, we should expect to see even um, less use of the military instrument. Nevertheless, things like public opinion are gonna matter, and gonna continue to matter, and probably matter a bit more. If you're Vladimir Putin, you can maybe sell the Russian people 
on why Ukraine was a worthwhile adventure, right? It is protecting ethnic Russians who are being abused by the Ukrainian state. This would be the narrative you get from the Russian Federation. But activities in Colombia, for example, or Venezuela are gonna be a much harder sell to the average Russian citizen. So I've given you a bit on Ukraine to give you some perspective and to suggest that some phenomena will hold. With that, let's focus in on Latin America and ask a simple question. Why bother? If you were Vladimir Putin, if you were the Kremlin, why would you engage in Latin America at a time where your forces are stretched thin in your own near abroad, in, in the Middle East, in places like Syria um, and elsewhere? And I think the answer is relatively clear once we dig in. First off, there's, evidence, there's ample evidence of Russian involvement in Latin America. And indeed, the former commanding general of US Southern Command, John, General John Kelly, made this very clear. And he noted why the Russians were doing it. They recognized it as the US's near abroad, in an area of historic US influence. And uh, Russian efforts, activities there were sim quite simply an attempt to erode US leadership and challenge US influence in the Western Hemisphere, according to General Kelly. In language, Andrei Kurdinov, who is the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, this is a Russian think tank, but the Russians conceive of their think tanks a bit more, a bit differently than we do as Americans. So in the US, think tanks are independent of the government. They may have a particular partisan uh, bent, but they tend to be independent in nature. This particular think tank was stood up by a presidential order by then president uh, Medvedev. Um, so the level of independence is much more limited here. And Kurtinov got on CNN International and said quite um, frankly, in explaining Russian activities in Venezuela, but also in the broader region to, the America, to an American audience saying, quote, if you mess in our backyard, you should keep in mind that we can mess in your backyard as well. There's probably another motivation here, and this third motivation has to do with a means of extracting hard currency. This is certainly relevant in Venezuela, um, maybe not so much hard currency, but there's economic activity there. The Russians have invested heavily in the Venezuelan regime, and importantly, they have massive debts that they need to protect to ensure that future debt servicing occurs in um, that case. But in the broader in the broader region beyond the Venezuelan case, which is pretty unique at the moment, there's a real opportunity to tap into the regional arms market. And we saw in 2017 for the first time, the Russian um, state-owned enterprise that's responsible for most of their foreign military sales was present and present in a pretty big way at Expo Defensa. Um, this is the largest regional arms um, sales conference. And importantly, Russia has been selling for quite a bit long time to all the countries like Venezuela and Bolivia. That shouldn't surprise anyone, but they've really tried to make inroads into major markets in the region to include Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil. All three of these are some of the largest purchasers of defense equipment in the region. And the former two are arguably the US's most important security uh, partners in the region as well. In terms of how they go about doing this, let me give you an example um, from the case of Colombia. I think that'll be better and a little bit more concrete than if I just tried to explain in abstract what the Russian approaches look like in Latin America. And so the first part of this approach involves finding an issue or a um, suite of issues that are divisive in nature. And so in Colombia, the Russians found a very easy one in terms of the peace process that led to the demobilization with the, uh, um, of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. So this was Colombia's longest um, standing Marxist organization. They, along with their smaller brother in the um, National Liberation Army, were both stood up in 1964 and had fought on continuously for over a half century. The FARC negotiated a peace deal with the government. The deal was set to be ratified by a popular referendum and it failed but it failed by minuscule margins, 49.8% voting in favor and 50.2% voting against. This was, in my assessment, having looked at the data broken down um, municipality by municipality, an accident of weather. The vote occurred when there were massive tropical storms, uh, disproportionately affecting uh, coastal areas of Colombia, 
um, where the turnout was much higher in favor than against relative to say the capital of Bogota or elsewhere. And unfortunately, turnout rates um, were quite lower in the areas hardest hit by these tropical storms. Had the weather been different, this referendum very well went, very well may have gone in favor of the referendum. Regardless, minimal revisions were made and the argument was rammed through the Colombian legislature um, and ratified then by the Supreme Court bypassing a popular referendum. There are questions by Colombian experts as to whether or not this is legal. I don't have an answer to that. I am not an expert in Colombian law. The reality is though, there are questions about the legality and that's enough of a kernel of a doubt for most people. And beyond that, those questions, there are concerns about the nature of the deal. In particular, what was seen as a weak transitional justice mechanism that many thought gave more or less amnesty to all members of the FARC. And it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, but the reality was the vast majority of FARC members did not face any type of um, confinement or they faced an alternative confinement um, procedure that didn't involve prison terms. So that was divisive. And perhaps more importantly, the deal guaranteed seats to the FARC in the legislature. And there were beliefs early on, the FARC would turn their massive war chest, estimated in the multiple billions of US dollars, into a political war chest and use this to dominate um, politics in Colombia. It turns out we know now that they actually weren't all that successful. They didn't have the popular support they thought they did, and they didn't fare particularly well in elections. But this was really concerning to many. And I did one particular interview with the, um, General of the Army, Otto Gibovich, who was the commanding general of the Peruvian Armed Forces, but in retirement, he retired in 2011. He has studied the Colombian model very, very closely. And he joked with me during one interview I did with him that politics would be the continuation of their war through other means that begin with congressmen and delegates in the parliament. And what General Gibovich is doing here is he's turning the Clausewitzian adage that war is the continuation of politics by other means on its head and arguing that the FARC is merely continuing the fight and the Colombian government have given them the means by which to do so. Regardless of your opinion on the peace process, that's immaterial. This is a divisive issue and one that the Russians have tapped into. So look, look at a couple, uh, so one way in which they've tapped into this is through misinformation, especially around elections. Um, related to candidates, but also related to the peace process. And what's particularly insidious here is the Russians aren't necessarily backing a particular candidate. We're in favor of Congressman X over um, Congressman Y. It's simply about um, increasing the amount of discord within the population and thereby weakening the effectiveness of in Colombian institutions, which means all they have to do is continue to um, ensure that divisive issues like the peace process remain front and, front and, front and center in the um, population's consciousness. And so looking at bullet two here, I'll come back to one, this has been a key thrust of some of their election-related misinformation. And it's not even necessarily misinformation. It's just getting that information out and repeatedly so you're bombarded with news surrounding the failure um, of the peace process, if you will. And I'm not necessarily making a personal assessment that it was a failure. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a sense of what these headlines look, might look like. And they've done this in a couple of ways. One, they've launched a couple of Russian um, language news services in Spanish. So Russia Today and Sputnik Media, both were launched with Spanish language affiliates within the region. And to an educated consumer, it's pretty obvious that this is Russian propaganda. I do look at RT and I look at Sputnik on a regular basis, but I do so because I want to get a sense of what the Russian party line is. I know very clearly that this is Kremlin-directed media. And so the average Colombian voter may not know that, but even amongst your educated voters, what RT has started doing, which is really interesting, and they've done this in Colombia, but also throughout much of the region, is they've started um, engage, making agreements, contractual agreements, with 300 plus cable TV providers in the region. So not all of these are big corporations like we're used to in the US. They don't have the budgets of your Fox News or your CNN or your MSNBC. And that means they're not producing all of their content. So what RT is doing in many of these agreements is they're saying, hey, listen, we'll pay to hire a local presenter who looks Colombian because, and sounds Colombian because he or she actually is Colombian. 
we'll pay for the creation of the content, the filming, the studio, whatever else goes into media uh, production. And we'll make sure that local interest stories get um, covered. And we're going to inject 5%, 10% content that we care about, which might be accurate stories about the peace process, but enough of them to ensure that this remains front and center. Or it might also be um, disinformation about a particular candidate or about a particular event designed to sway a narrative in a particular um, direction. So this is a much cheaper strategy relative to deploying military force, for example, and yet it delivers influence and it does so in a way that's almost undetectable because very, very few people are looking at these contracts that exist between local television um, news services and foreign entities. And indeed, many of these contracts aren't actually publicly available. So even if you wanted to dig into it, you couldn't review all of the contract terms particularly easily. Um, so that's one lever. On the other end, there's been ample evidence of election-related hacking, a lot coming out of Eastern Europe, but also a lot coming out of Venezuela. Um, various um, open source estimations suggest that these are Russian capabilities just being run through server farms in Venezuela. But during the last presidential election, for example, both US defense officials, as well as the former um, Colombian president and his minister of defense cited upwards of 60,000 attacks against voter rolls in Colombia. And so it's unclear from the open source analysis whether or not any of these attacks were particularly successful, but again, it creates a kernel of a doubt for future Russian engagement. Was candidate X fairly elected or was it due to meddling in the voter rolls? Because after all, 60,000 attacks, what are the probability here that at least one of them was successful and perhaps the effect wasn't fully detected and fully corrected for? Who knows? I don't actually have enough information to make a good assessment as to whether or not it changed the outcome of an election. My guess is it probably didn't though, but that's speculation. But that's not the point here. It's about sowing those seeds of doubt. And then finally, if nothing else works, and this is something that uh, Russia could potentially do, although I think this is a very low probability event, is take advantage of the fact that even if the deal has with the FARC hasn't totally disintegrated, there have been members of the FARC who have become frustrated and remobilized. You also have the ELN, which has not yet negotiated an agreement. There are violent non-state actors still evident in Colombia. They are benefiting from secure bases of operation across the border in Venezuela. And there's a very cheap opportunity for, Russians, for the Russian government to provide them with some type of military assistance. Um, think unconventional warfare type activities. Could arming these individuals enable them at a very minimal cost to the Russian Federation to do serious damage to US or to Colombian interests? And the answer is likely yes. Is the risk to the Russians of being uncovered and uh, um, for doing this worth actually engaging in these types of activities? I'm not sure. My best guess would be no, not as long as options one and two are continuing to yield dividends, and they appear to be, which is something I wanted to put on the radar. We often talk about unconventional warfare in these types of domains um, and never really drill down into it as much as we should. In terms of response, and so I've given you the example of Colombia. This is not unique to Colombia. My friend Fabiana Pereira at the National Defense University is an expert on Venezuela. The activities in Venezuela are, as I noted previously, quite a bit different in nature just than the local environment in Venezuela. But there's definitely lots of Russian activity there. There's allegations of Russian meddling, very similar to what I described in Colombia in Mexico's last presidential elections, um, as well as elsewhere in the region. Although the most noted examples are those three that I've given which makes sense. Two are major US security partners in the region, and one is an area where the Russians have a lot of financial interest at stake. Fortunately, though, there are opportunities to respond to these types of threats. They are, however, difficult. And I think this involves dispelling ambiguity, um, denying the adversary, in this case Russia, the ability to operate in the gray zones, unmask their, op um, their operations show very clearly that they are providing cable TV content to whatever those networks are, um, and so on and so forth. Dispelling amb uh, ambiguity, of course, requires detecting that pernicious content in the first place. And unfortunately, this is relatively difficult to do in many of the domains where it's occurring. 
I gave you the example of cable TV news, and that's relatively easier, right? I was able to document the 300 plus news services um, that are re receiving Russian content. Where this becomes harder is on social media and on cellular connectivity. So WhatsApp is a messaging, encrypted messaging service that's really popular in Latin America, um, as well as elsewhere in the world. But I remember when I lived in Peru and Colombia, with my cell phone plan, I had to pay for the minutes, I had to pay for the data, but I got unlimited WhatsApp included for free with my plan, and it came with pretty much every other cell phone plan that was available from any carrier in both of those countries where I lived. And that means a lot of communication is happening on your phone via WhatsApp, and that's another environment for this type of propaganda. Unfortunately, news now gets shared via these mechanisms. Younger generations are reading news on um, on social media platforms and on encrypted messaging platforms in short sound bites, right? They're getting their news from Twitter, for example, as opposed to the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. And so this makes it much more difficult to interdict or to detect this content, as we've seen based on, say, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Google's struggle to deal with um, extremist content on their platform. So they focus less so on the Russian meddling and more so on how do you get the Islamic State off of Facebook. And indeed, they struggled pretty seriously. The first effort by um, Facebook in, was something called Trusted Flagger, where they literally had experts on their platform flagging suspect content. So humans were doing this. You'd think you'd expect a AI, machine learning driven approach by a giant like Facebook and yet humans in the loop were a core of their initial strategy. Have they developed over time? Absolutely. Are their current strategies now much more computer driven? For sure. Unfortunately, however, this is what um, armor officers would recognize as a gun armor race. They, as Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, et cetera, innovate to prevent the abuse of their platform, the cost for them doing so increases exponentially Whereas the cost for the bad actors to continue to over, um, do what they're doing by overcoming these countermeasures only increases in a linear fashion. And as such, what you see is a widening delta um, between what's possible to do in terms of damage on these platforms versus what it's po how it is possible, and what it costs to detect and deter these activities. So unfortunately, this content's here to stay. Can you get better at it? Can governments get better at it detection? Perhaps. Intelligence um, and intelligence sharing, the relationships are already well developed between the US and Colombia, so that may be a real opportunity. But you also need to use intelligence to gain information to counter these false narratives. And here's where I think there's a real opportunity and where I think Colombia in particular um, has the ability to take a lead in these initiatives. But before I get into the, uh, before I expand on that, let's just look at what makes information operations, whether they're run by the Russians, or counter information operations, say something that I would uh, suggest the Colombian government might do to counter Russian influence, um, work. And I think there's a couple factors to consider. One, why these operations often appear credible, right? It's not wildly insane content. It's stuff that's based in some semblance of reality, which is why um, campaigns around a already existing real-world divisive issue, like the peace process, work. In, we also know that it, repeated exposure across platforms does a really good job of increasing beliefs. If I were to tell you something right now that was outlandish, you wouldn't believe me. You'd be skeptical. If you were to then, after getting off this call, read your favorite newspaper and hear something similar in that newspaper, um, you'd be a little less skeptical. If you then heard it around your dinner table discussion or saw it on Twitter, you become less susceptible. It doesn't matter, it turns out, how outlandish the message is. Repeated exposure from uh, multiple sources has a subconscious effect on our willingness to believe content. The other thing that matters is sharing or endorsement by local celebrity figures or just local figures that you know and trust personally. So this is why things like Facebook and Twitter are potentially dangerous. I don't actually have Twitter, but if I did, I might retweet, retweet an article that I found interesting. And someone who's a casual user might say, okay, Barnett, I've inter interacted with him in a form like this. I trust his judgment a little bit. So I'm gonna take this at face value. and I'm just gonna read the headline. But for all you know, I was retweeting that article because I thought it was outlandish and I thought it was worth 
taking a look at to see what was going on here, but it wasn't necessarily an endorsement. Or there might have been something in the article that I found valuable, but the title doesn't actually reflect the article, as is always true with online media. The title has to get you to click on it, so it doesn't necessarily reflect the content. And the average user isn't going to necessarily read the whole article, and they're just going to assume Barnett's endorsing the title here. So that's dangerous. But also, what happens when local celebrities, um, and this can be anyone from a major politician to the Kardashians, endorse this type of content? And we'll see very clearly. Let me show you a video from Marine Le Pen. This was uh, an interview she did on CNN. And this was done at a point in the run-up to the last Fred French presidential elections, when at a point in that time when she looked like the front runner. She looked like she was going to be the next president of France. Obviously, you all know she ended up losing that race, but she, did, but she lost, even in losing, she had about a third of the French public vote for her. That is a third of the French public, many of whom probably could not have found Ukraine on a map, um, were willing to take their only piece of information from Ukraine from this woman, and thus likely to believe what she was saying. So let's see what she says about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's not just what I think, it's the reality. There was a coup d'etat, there was an agreement among different nations, and the next day, this agreement was broken, and some people took power. There was a referendum. After the invasion and the annexation. Yes. Mais il n'y a pas eu d'invasion de la, de la Crimée, enfin, écoutez, no, faut arrêter. Non, invasion de la Crimée. Annexe Crimea. It was part of Ukraine. And the French were part of the deal that guaranteed the independence of Ukraine in 1994. It's really important, this, because it's the fundamentals of international law. La Crimée, la Crimée était russe. D'accord, la Crimée a toujours été russe. Russian. It has always been Russian. It's not that long ago. It was given so it's fine for you, though. by Soviet leaders. You're okay with it, are you? The people feel Russian. The people decided by a great majority that they wanted to belong to Russia. So we can't be democratic when uh, it suits us and then reject. So you democracy. support lifting the sanctions? I'm trying to ask you that. Or should they, should they be conditional to the implementation of the ceasefire agreement known as the Minsk Accord? These sanctions are completely stupid. So if I'm the average friend. French voter, or rather one third of the average French voters, who have no particular interest or background knowledge on Ukraine, I've suddenly formed an opinion that the Russians were in the right and the Ukrainians were in the wrong, simply because Marine Le Pen indicated that, of course, everyone knows Crimea has always been part of Russia, and the sanctions against Russia are, quote, absolutely stupid. In reality, we know that Le Pen's campaign was largely financed by a number of state-owned Russian banks, and there's a whole bunch of other detail that goes that undergirds this, but again, the average individual is not necessarily aware of that. So keep in mind why these types of narratives appear credible. Those same types of um, those same reasons are going to matter for effective counter-information operations. And Colombia has had some really good successes with military information support operations. Let me play you another clip here. This is from a um, campaign that's, been, that's either known as Operation Christmas or Operation Rivers of Light. And this was a demobilization campaign targeting the FARC that worked really, really well. And it worked really well because it picked up on an issue that wasn't divisive, that all Colombians could, re, um, could um, unite over, and specifically celebrating Christmas in an overwhelmingly Catholic country, it doesn't matter if you are a FARC guerrilla or a Colombian army soldier. You care about Christmas and you care about spending um, Christmas with family. This operation has as objective that the bandit receive this wave, which will send a message to the Colombian people so that they will return to Christmas with their families. Tres de la tarde, 46 minutos, la emisora del Ejército Nacional. Seguimos con esta buena programación para todos nuestros oyentes que están escuchando la emisora del Ejército Nacional. Estamos invitando a todas las personas, allí madre, hijos, amigos de los que hacen parte de la FARC, invitándolos a que en esta Navidad les envíen un mensaje 
un regalo, diciéndole allí para que se desmovilicen, para que vuelvan a casa, que hay una familia que los espera, para que ellos vuelvan a la libertad, para que pasen una Navidad en familia. Que por favor se desmovilicen, que la familia los espera con los brazos abiertos. Cabellera, desmovilícense, la Navidad te espera. Y busquen su familia y vayan a la Navidad, que están todas sus familias esperándolos. Estar al pie de su familia, su papá, su mamá, sus hermanos. Y acá afuera todos los colombianos lo esperamos con los brazos abiertos. regresen al seno de sus hogares que lo que queremos en este país los 46 millones de colombianos y el mundo entero es la paz and so as the clip indicated there was a one demobilization every six hours 300 and something far fighters demobilized as a result of this it was successful because the messaging was well it was tailored to be something that everyone cared about christmas the messaging appeared credible so these were notes in those orbs that were floated down river from mothers, from family members of fire eaters, but also the mess, similar messages were disseminated by um, major politicians. You saw the president at the, of Columbia, the then president of Columbia at the time, um, giving a speech while disseminating messages. It was put out over multiple different medium, whether it was the little print paper messages that went in those floating orbs, whether it was armed forces radio, but also civilian radio stations, television news, print media, et cetera. So you got that ex repeated exposure bit. Um, and it was a super successful campaign. There's no reason you couldn't use the same tenets of this to counteract some of the divisive messaging that's going on around elections or around issues like the FARC demobilization or others. And it's going to vary by country to country what the issue is they pick up on. Over the long term, the true answer is inoculation. Until you teach your population, and this is a generational thing, this is not something that can be accomplished this year or next year, to be better, more educated consumers of social media and regular media, this is going to still continue to be an important vector for um, influence. That said, I think I hopefully made my point here. I didn't get super deep in any of these issues, but I wanted to make sure we leave enough time for Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes, 14 minutes now. Before I open it up, let me just quickly conclude. Um, I think what we've noticed is one, there are Russian efforts at gaining influence in the Western Hemisphere, just as there are Russian efforts at gaining influence in all different parts of the world. If there is a US interest, that's good enough for the Russians to be there. But if there's a Russian interest, that's also very good for them to be there. In this case, there's both. Decrease US in, um, influence in their own near abroad and potentially capitalize on lucrative markets for arms sales. That said, how these campaigns play out are going to vary from region to region and then from country to country. The regional variation, the relative use of, say, the military versus non-military instruments and powers is going to change pretty massively. It's much easier for the Russian Federation to commit military forces in a country like Ukraine, where they share a land border and where they have arguably their most important naval base in Sevastopol. Um, it's much, much harder for them to do that in the Western Hemisphere, so they will rely even more on other instruments. And influence has been one where they've excelled, so we should expect to see that elsewhere. The specific narrative is not something that they're going to create out of thin air. It's going to be based on what's going to resonate in that local um, public. So the, um, the FARC peace deal was a great one for Colombia. It will be different in Mexico, for example, or anywhere else in the region. 
but local experts, local politicians should have a good sense of what the divisive issues are already. So hopefully I've made a, my point. Hopefully this has been an engaging discussion. I've certainly enjoyed talking um, at you all, but I'm looking much more forward to talking with you all. So I want to give you my contact information in case anyone wants to contact me afterwards. But with that said, what we're going to do now is open it up for questions and Erin is going to moderate. Yes, um, thank you so much, Barnett. Uh, everyone, as a reminder, please put your questions in the chat, send it to me, and um, I will send that over to Barnett. Um, I also just dropped a link to Barnett's latest publication in the chat, so you can um, explore his latest publication on um, Special Operations Forces-led counterterrorism efforts. Um, now, I do have one question for you, Barnett, uh, from Marcelo Martinez. His question is, uh, your presentation shows that it shows gray zones as a space where conflicts can happen for different reasons, mm -hmm. and maybe with the influence of big countries. Is there any indication that China is involved in gray zones in general or um, specifically in the region that you're discussing? Absolutely. There's plenty of evidence of Chinese gray zone competition, generally speaking. Um, and I actually think China, I'm, so I'm not a China expert, which is why I chose to focus in on Russian activities, since it's something I've done a lot more work on. My colleague, Devin, at Stark is the China, is the Sinologist. Um, so he would be better equipped to answer that question. But certainly, Marcelo, we've seen evidence of Chinese gray zone activities. The Chinese have realized very clearly that these sort of salami slicing tactics, where they go after just a bit of their interest at a time, makes it much less likely that the US or the West is going to intervene um, against them. And we've seen this especially so in sort of their territorial claims in the South China Sea. The Chinese activities are actually far more concerning to me than the Russian activities. I would argue that Putin is doing a masterful job of playing a really terrible hand, right? The cards he's been dealt are not great. The economy in Russia is um, pretty terrible. China, on the other hand, is not without its problems, but has a lot more going for it. And importantly, what we've seen in the Chinese case is they've been much more measured and much more incremental or gradual in their approaches because they recognize that they can afford to play the long game. Um, and you see this in particular sort of their island building campaign in the South, in the South China Sea. Anyone that's building artificial islands to extend, extend their economic exclusion zone, arguably speaking, and also to emplace um, anti-access, uh, um, anti aerial denial type systems is playing a really long game. They're not planning on winning two years down the line, road, they're thinking 30 or 100 years down the line. So the Chinese activities are actually far more concerning to me than the Russian activities. In terms of their interest in the region, um, They've tried a, they've also tried a soft power approach, right? They're not gonna project military force. They don't have a blue water Navy. They understand that this is hugely costly and they've watched the US spend um, ample blood and treasure trying to do this overseas in places like the Middle East. What they are doing though is trying to assert a economic leverage. And you see this in a number of respects. First off, they're also quite interested in foreign military sales to the region, and they're a smaller player, but they've rose pretty substantially in their sales to Latin America over the last few years. But perhaps more importantly, infrastructure development, loans, things of that sort. And we've seen this in places like Ecuador, for example. And the terms of these um, loans are often pretty abusive in nature and are designed to guarantee each, um, Chinese access to these markets in perpetuity, or at least over the long term i.e. when a particular country defaults on the uh, loan that, that built the dam, that paid for the Chinese to build the dam, the Chinese now own um, that infrastructure, that piece of critical infrastructure and have a permanent access point to these countries. So we're seeing quite a bit of this activity in the region. Um, Ecuador in particular has had some issues with this and have already started experiencing some of those negative effects that happen when you don't repay the Chinese for these investments. And their approach, however, is I think less nuanced and less regionally specific. What they've done in Ecuador looks very symbol, similar to what they've done in Southern Africa, to what they've done in places like Baluchistan in Pakistan. 
So a slightly different approach, but absolutely, um, it's happening. The emphasis, though, I guess more on economic activity versus information, although information is becoming important, and we've seen uh, burgeoning I.O. capabilities on the part of the Chinese. Interestingly enough, this, their response to the COVID-19 um, crisis and specifically um, some of the negative press they're getting have given us a really, some really interesting insights into how their information operations capabilities are advancing. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Vanessa has another question. Uh, what is public opinion of Russia in Latin America and is positive public opinion growing towards Russia with their soft power tactics and media influence? I think it depends on the audience. And I think the Russians have also looked at what the Chinese are doing. And I remember a few years ago, a great economist cartoon, and it showed an individual crossing out graffiti on a building somewhere in the region. And the graffiti had said, Yankee, go home. Um, and they had crossed out Yankee and they had written in China with a spray can. I thought that was um, entertaining. But it, I think the Russians have realized the Chinese for their approach have engendered some backlash in the region and have been more careful in this regard, right? Their involvement in the region is less visible to the average citizen. That said, they have made it real inroads with security services and they've done so through foreign military sales. Um, they offer a cheaper product than in the United States, and importantly, um, they offer a product that comes with no strings attached. And so I remember being in Peru in 2015, and at that time, Peru was having a serious issue with narco trafficking. I guess they still are. They're um, one of the region's largest producers of coca, cola, of coca leaf. And the only thing that had worked historically in the Peruvian case was a program called Airbridge Denial, where in the Peruvian Air Force, with targeting coordinates provided by the CIA, went up and shot down narco-trafficking aircraft. There was a terrible accident, to be brief, I won't get into the details here, and the U.S. stopped providing um, the airborne early warning systems to actually allow the Peruvian Air Force to go target these planes. Peru doesn't have radar coverage over most of their um, country, by the way. And Peru desperately wanted to purchase the equipment to enable them to do this on their own, and they first approached the U.S. government, trying to purchase um, airborne early warning radar and other kit from the U.S. government, and the U.S. government refused. And I was talking to a number of Peruvian Air Force officers at the time, because I was living there, and they were really upset. And their take to me was, okay, the U.S. government wants us to do coca eradication. They care about counter-narcotics, but they want us to do it manually in a way where we're losing 50 soldiers and police officers every year, and that's preferable to selling us the equipment that would allow us to do this without taking losses, because when, last time we tried this, two Americans died. So two American lives are worth more than hundreds of Peruvian lives. And that was the narrative that I kept getting from Peruvian Air Force officers. And it was something that I didn't have a good answer to. Russia's providing support, providing whatever these, these militaries want with no strings attached. If you can pay, it's yours, more or less. So in some security forces, Russia has done a really good job of courting influence where the U.S. has been unable to meet the local need, unable or unwilling to meet the local needs. And in addition, Russia, as well as China, has stepped up sort of foreign military training, educational exchanges, et cetera, that do have some effect. And I remember I mentioned, I gave the quote from Otto Gibovich, the um, former commanding general of the Peruvian army. He was also a recipient many, many decades ago um, of training provided by then the Soviet Union. And he was telling me during one of the interviews I did with him over a meal um, very fondly about his time in the Soviet Union. This was a Peruvian army officer who was very favorable to the United States. And nonetheless, the training he received by the Soviets had an effect, had left an impression upon him decades out. So yes, I think there is um, a risk of Russian increasing influence within certain critical populations, but for the most part, their activities aren't all that visible um, to the general public, which means they're not necessarily having a positive pro-Russian spin towards uh, that's generated, but they're also not getting any of the backlash that the Chinese are publicly getting to the region. All right. Um, Pallavi has a question as well. <clears throat> Excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, what is Russia's and gray zone involvement in East and Southeast Asia? So I am less of an expert on sort of um, the Indo-PACOM area of responsibilities. As I mentioned, um, our colleague, Gavin, is sort of the sinologist and focuses more on that. 
but the question was, sorry, what was the Russian or the yes, Chinese? Yes, what's uh, Russian? Russian. Yeah, so I'm honestly not sure. I don't have good evidence and I don't want to try and answer the question by making something up. But I would guess that Devin would know something since he focuses on China and that's historically their near abroad and where they're doing a lot of activity. I think there's, generally speaking, if I can reinterpret the question so I can provide you some sense of an answer, there is an interesting relationship between Russia and China where they at times try and collaborate a bit more because they see that as allowing them some leverage against the United States but I don't really see them as uh, close partners in this. And I would suggest the Russians may be interested in trying to exert influence uh, in areas that China cares about um, for use in future contests that may emerge, but I'm not really sure. I'm not an expert on this, so take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> That's okay. Um, everyone, you're also welcome to go to our website, start.umd.edu and uh, check out Devin Ellis. A lot of his research uh, will be on his page on our website. Um, Thomas is asking, would you support the argument that Russia's interest in South America is in regards to attempts to influence South American hydrocarbon market, which supports such a large portion of the Russian economy? So in Venezuela, absolutely. Um, I, and it's very clear to me that a lot, so most of the Russian as well as the Chinese debt um, owed by the, or rather the debt owed to Russia and China by the Venezuelan state are secured against collateral that is largely hydrocarbons or other extractive resources because that's the if i were a banker and i were lending to venezuela uh, that would be the only thing i would accept as collateral that seems remotely safe although there's arguably it'll be it'll be interesting to see whether or not a new government should the venezuelan uh, regime fall um is willing to honor those deals so there's some real risk there that but yes in venezuela it's all about hydrocarbon rents in the rest of the region, I think it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more diverse than that. Russian activities in Mexico and Colombia, even though both of those countries are oil producers, um, have been more, I would argue, targeted towards degrading U.S. influence um, in its two most important regional security partners. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Diana is asking, what do you think will be the position of Russia if the Venezuelan crisis gets worse, or if there's a conflict with other countries such as Colombia or Brazil? Will Russia send troops or provide military assistance? I would, again, speculation here. I think there's a point at which every investor, and if you, you can think about this sort of like your Goldman Sachs or, or your JP Morgan Chase, realizes that throwing more money or more resources after a bad loan is just not worth. Um, and I think the Russians will eventually come to that same realization in the event of a shooting war between, say, Venezuela and Colombia or Brazil. I don't think a shooting war with, between Venezuela and its neighbors is all that likely, but I would be very skeptical to suggest that Russia will send ground forces or any major military contingent to defend Venezuela. That's just a bad investment. And it's a bad investment at a time when Russia doesn't really have a competent conventional military force. Um, there was a great article written by Jason Lyle at Yale looking at Russian artillery fires during the Second Chechen War, wherein he observed that fully 29% of Russian artillery fires missed their mark due to drunk and or high field artillery crews. Right? This is not a hallmark of a modern functional armed forces. The Russian special operations community, on the other hand, is very, very capable but they're very small in number. And if I were Russia, would I be willing to send a few military advisors to embed with Venezuelan soft? Maybe. Would I be willing to do anything that's either more overt or more expensive than that? No, because it's throwing good money after bad, or in this case, good resources after bad. So I think Russia's gonna approach this with a grain of salt, and Venezuela is a useful jumping off point for Russian operations elsewhere in the region. As noted, many of those attacks on Colombian um, computer systems involved with the elections were launched from Venezuelan servers. And it's also worth in Russia, as well as China's interest to at least do something to maintain their influence in the region in case Maduro is able to hold on and there's an opportunity to not necessarily be made whole, but to get paid back at least in part for the debt obligations that Venezuela owes Russia. But major military deployments to defend the regime, not going to happen. 
All right, great, thank you. Um, for our participants, I'll note that it is one o'clock in case uh, you have to run or anything. Um, we'll keep going with there are a couple more questions left, um, but Barnett mentioned that he's able to stick around for a little bit longer, so we'll get your questions answered. Um, you, If you do have to duck out, you the recording for this event will be on START's website. Um, and I just sent everyone the link to our events page, so you're welcome. So it'll our, the recording of this event will be on this event's event page on our website. Um, but moving on, so Aaron's question is, uh, you mentioned briefly that public support for war sways depending on casualties. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on this concept and how it may impact today's environment? Absolutely. So I think this was a phenomenon that was first observed in Vietnam, first time you got near real time war reporting, right? You had embedded uh, newscasters and whatnot, and you actually got that footage on the nightly news in, during the Vietnam War. And it simply a factor, it's simply a matter of the fact that the American public is not willing to risk massive amounts of casualties in support of object objectives overseas that are not clearly an existential threat to US national security. And that may not be an objective assessment by the American, the average American as to what is or is not a um, existential threat to US national security, but something like World War I or World War II, total wars, okay, yes, sure. That's, a, that's not a war, uh, that's a war of necessity and not an optional war. Other engagements overseas are seen much more, uh, much differently. And while there may be widespread support, that support vanishes pretty quickly as the cost uh, costs mount. And I think we saw that with sort of U.S. support for um, overseas engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? The overwhelming, overwhelming support following 9-11, the U.S. had just been attacked, but that steadily waned to extremely low levels now which arguably also impacted Obama's serious strategy insofar as he knew there was no possible public support for major conventional deployments to solve that crisis, if it was even solvable. We, and again, so the literature has documented um, this pretty well by using public opinion polling, which simply suggests that as, ca as wars drag on and the financial costs, but especially the casualties mount, um, public opinion turns against them in all but the most extreme cases where it really is viewed as a fight for national survival. And I think the interesting finding that I was trying to highlight is we've long recognized that this was the case and that this was consequential in democratic societies, right? If I am opposed to a particular war and 70% of the American public um, is opposed to that as well, we're gonna vote out our politicians who are continuing to support that effort if they don't change their behavior. And as such, they're responsive to public opinion. I think what we didn't realize was that autocratic regimes, and I would argue that, that Russia is not technically a democracy um, in the sense that yes, there are elections, but they're certainly not free and fair, um, have similar phenomena. And the polling from the Second Chechen War suggests that the public opinion does follow this closely and does care um, and can exert influence, even if it's not through the ballot box. And Putin has demonstrated very clearly that he um, thinks this is consequential as well. In his annual um, addresses to the Russian public, so think of this as sort of like the US President's State of the Union address, he always articulates that no Russian forces are fighting and dying in overseas wars. Um, that's farcical, but he's made Russian forces who were deployed to Ukraine sign these fake separation from service agreements that suggested that they had left their Russian units, uh, left the Russian military. Yet they, of course, crossed over the border with their command structure intact in their um, original units and with all of their crew served weapon systems and heavy equipment. So it's farcical, but he's going through the charade for a reason. And it's not so much about convincing the West, it's about convincing his domestic public. All right, great. Um, Pallavi has another question. As we mm -hmm. see a reduction in Russia's military diplomacy in India, how do we see Russia's, ro Russia's role in the country? Perfect. I don't know anything about Russia's engagement <laughs> in India, so I'm going to pass on that. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, Stephen has a question. What do you think the reaction will be if the government of Colombia starts aerial fumigation and how are the Russians trying to prevent it? So I'm not certain the Colombian government is going to do that, although it's a possibility given that if 
you've been following this closely, and it sounds like you already know this, uh, cocoa cultivation in Colombia has gone up massively since the peace deal with the FARC. Um, there's a lot of objections to aerial fumigation given health concerns and the fact that these pesticides or herbicides, whatever they are, I'm not a chemist, are not particularly precise, i.e. you end up wiping out um, a lot of crops and not just coca. So that runs counter to any type of alternative development scheme because you're gonna kill the cacao or the asparagus or the whatever. Um, but my guess is there will be enough public backlash to this uh, that it may not happen. Or if it does happen, that public backlash is that decisiveness and that gives you a perfect additional lever if you're Russia for something to play on if you're trying to influence rural populations. The average Colombian living in Bogota or any of Colombia's five major cities probably doesn't really care about this issue. The average person living in an agrarian society is going to be more um, influenced by this and this would be a perfect kernel of truth around which to run a new IO campaign. So should this factor into Colombia's decision as to whether or not they do it in a major way? Probably not, but I would argue that pursuing this may give the Russians just another lever that they can pull off. If this is in fact the best approach for Colombia to counter narcotics, then this is probably, giving the Russians another lever is probably a minor consideration because they're gonna find something elsewhere regardless. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Steve has a question. Uh, you've mentioned Colombia, Peru, and Brazil, but is Russia currently running any operations in the arguably more strategic country of Panama? It would not surprise me given all the transshipment. I don't know this for a fact. I have not looked, but certainly the canal is a critical um, choke point for international trade. And there's also a fair bit of smuggling that goes through there. So I would be shocked if the Russians weren't uh, paying attention and doing something in that domain. But I don't know how pronounced it is. It's not a country I've looked at in considerable detail. Okay, great. Um, so that was the last question I had. Um, did you get any questions in your chat, Barnett? Oh, no. Um, I got one from Vanessa, but it sounded very similar to one of the ones you <clears throat> read to me about public opinion of Russia in Latin America. So I think that's already been answered. Okay, and I actually just got another question. That's okay. Ah. Um, and you guys, you're, you're welcome to continue sending me questions for a little while. At, at some point, I'm, I am going to call enough, but for right now, I think it's fine if you guys want to keep going, as long, Barnett, as long as you're able to continue. I'm happy. Um, sure. So we have, I have a question from Howard. Uh, is there any attempt to counter the purchase or influence over regional cable providers? Not a ton, because it's not been an issue that's been that's gotten much attention whatsoever. This is happening relatively covertly, simply because these negotiations are happening in private. Most of these agreements are not um, easily accessible in the public domain. Yes, you can often get access to them through the local equivalent of the um, FCC in each country, but that's an arduous task. And that means most people are not even aware this is happening. So no, not really. Uh, that said, the Global Engagement Center, which is the state um, run out of the U.S. State Department, has been, I don't know if they've been looking specifically at this particular issue with Russian involvement in cable television in Latin America, but they have recognized that there are these levers of influence and perhaps there are ways to counter it. And if you look at some of their solic solicitations for um, grant funding and things of that sort, it suggests that they're tracking these issues in terms of what they funded and what they're actually doing in this domain. I don't honestly know. Unfortunately, the GEC is one of those institutions that I think is a great idea, uh, but it's underfunded and under-resourced. So if anyone was doing it, it would be them. But my guess is the extent to which it's happening is quite minimal. Sure. Um, and unless we have any more questions, I, it looks like that's, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> People keep sending me questions at the very last second. No problem. That's okay, that's not that's fine. This, this is fun. Um, so Aaron had another question. Uh, you mentioned a strategic solution to be increasing technological literacy in terms of countering disinformation, but what do you see as a potential tactical or operational efforts? What do you see as potential tactical or operational efforts that can be made? So I am not a computer scientist. On um, the, I think it's, I think the issue is it's, as I said, a gun armor race. So it's getting harder and harder to interdict this. Um, 
material and it's getting more and more expensive. I think there have been tremendous advancements in sort of AI machine learning um, to process some of this text and even to process some of this content when it comes out in image or uh, video form. And obviously analyzing video is extremely cost costly back when you used to have analysts sitting and doing full motion video analysis. Um, so those types of innovations have helped and can help at the tactical level to flag this material. But I still think it's a losing battle. You just have too many nefarious actors putting out too much content on too many different um, platforms. One thing that is productive and that um, the industry is already starting to do is collaboration across platforms. So Twitter is now part of the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. Facebook, YouTube, uh, Microsoft, they're all members as well. So they're sharing information about what's been tried on their platform, whether it's by the Russians or by the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda. And that way, um, they're also sharing solutions as well. So Facebook can take a solution and that Twitter came up with and modify it and be able to target that content more efficiently. So I think that's a great innovation. Um, I think it's too little. To, I think it's unfortunately too little too late given the relative cost of doing bad things with social media versus the relative cost of stopping it. I think market trends are also really problematic here. The average consumer is pushing for better levels of security. And what this is mean, and Facebook has very clearly articulated that they plan to go to a fully encrypted platform. So all comms run through Facebook will be encrypted um, end to end. And that may be great for con consumer privacy and that's why they're doing it. Um, it may be great for the security of commerce that happens over some of these platforms with ad revenue or things being sold or whatnot. And again, that's why they're doing it. But it makes it that much harder for not only the platforms themselves, but also for governments and others to monitor nefarious activities. So there's the civil rights, civil liberties trade off, right? We want our privacy, um, but it's leading to these changes that make it next to impossible to see what's going on. And I'll give you an example of this. So, WhatsApp, I gave you the example of that already, the um, chat feature. And there was an Italian member of the Islamic State who was plotting an attack using WhatsApp. And the Italians knew they couldn't break the encryption on WhatsApp. And so what they were ultimately able to bug the guy's car where he was taking the WhatsApp voice over internet protocol calls and listen in, but they never actually broke the encryption. And if everything moves to being encrypted, we won't even know what's going on in these platforms, absent the use of national technical means by the most sophisticated intelligence services in the world, which means most of the region won't have the ability to monitor any of this type of activity occurring, and it makes it that much easier. So I don't know that I gave you a great answer here. I think there's certain things you can do around the margins, like collaboration amongst industry, but at the end of the day, I think this is unfortunately a losing battle, and the long-term solution is inoculate your population, better education, better informed consumers, and this is something we should be teaching. And for the parents in the room, um, what your kids do on social media is there in perpetuity. Future employers will see this, colleges will see this, et cetera. So it's not just about um, minimizing sort of Russian ability to take advantage of these platforms. There's all kinds of implications that we don't think of as the average consumer. Sure. Um, Ryan has a question. Uh, you've talked extensively about the inverse relationship between political will to fight and casualties. Mm -hmm. Is the tolerance for casualties in an unconventional or gray area flat conflict higher than a conventional conflict? And does this become a target of information operations? Okay, great questions. On the first bit, absolutely. Using unconventional warfare, the casualty um, helps to deal with the casualty sensitivity. Right, special operations forces are deniable. They tend to be more ambiguous, uh, which is not to say that there's no record of their activities and it's not, and it's certainly a travesty when soft are killed or injured, but that gives governments and politicians more freedom of maneuver. They can deploy these forces and even if they do get killed, it's less visible to the domestic public. So that sort of minimizes some of the casualty sensitivities. There's limits to what you can do there. In terms of, is the, are the casualties themselves a lever? Absolutely. And I'm actually, I wrote a piece for a edited volume that the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy was putting together, and then I'm now working on updating and turning into a uh, more mainstream academic publication, looking at exactly this and looking at if there were opportunities to impose cost on the Russians for their activities in Ukraine. And specifically what I argued there 
was, okay, great, provide the Ukrainians javelins, um, anti-tank guided munitions, um, so that they can kill Russian tanks, provide them with counter-battery radar, um, again, the equipment that they would need to counter the most um, damaging Russian pieces of equipment that they were using in the Donbass. And that's great. That'll give you the tactical victories that the Ukrainians are looking for. It will not translate to, um, might translate to operational outcomes. It will not translate to high operational or strategic outcomes. If you could, however, couple this with an information campaign that said, look, this javelin killed this Russian tank and four Russian soldiers who Putin has said were not actually fighting and dying in Ukraine were just killed in Ukraine by Ukrainian forces. That could actually be used to turn Russian public support for these engagements um, in a completely different direction and undermine Putin's freedom of maneuver when it comes to engaging in these over for overseas expeditions. Um, and in, that, in the article that will be coming out, um, probably in 2021, I think the publisher is, I think I owe it to the publisher in December of this year, I look at exactly how you would document these Russian casualties using open source uh, means of collection and how you would transmit this to the Russian public in a means that would be credible to them, right? You can't exactly go on Voice of America and say, hey, this happened. It won't be credible to the Russian population. So yes, I think there's a really important lever that the US government ought to be using against the Russians and, but also one that the Russians could use against their targets here. Um, if they can collect data on how many Colombian forces are being killed in continuing conflict, despite the fact that there's supposedly peace now, that could be a great piece of information that could erode support for Colombian government activities. So it could work either way, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give, so that's the last question I have so far. I'll give you everyone a minute in case anyone is typing frantically because they have a question. Um, I will note that uh, Barnett mentioned um, he has future publication coming out. If you'd like to sign up for our monthly newsletter, you can do that through our website and you'll definitely be alerted uh, when his publication comes out and you'll also be able to see all of the other research uh, that START puts out regularly. Um, so I haven't seen any sudden questions yet, so I think we might be done. Um, so Barnett, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Aaron, thank you for moderating. For everyone in the audience, thank you so much for not only calling in, but for staying an extra 20 minutes. The most fun portion of these things for me are sort of the back and forth. And unfortunately, we're not able to have as much of a conversation given this new online modality, but even getting a sense of what the questions are, give me a sense of where people are coming from, and that's awesome. So thank you for making it interesting to me, and have a great day. Great, thank you. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us today. I did drop the link to our events page in the website, so if you enjoyed uh, today's event, I would encourage you to sign up for one of our future ones. Um, and otherwise, everyone have a great day. <laughs>